everyone. Welcome back to Top Line Edmonton. It's uh, It's been a very good week for the Edmonton Oilers. And here to break it down, as usual, I'm one half of your co-host, Nick Lynham, here with our Edmonton Oilers resident fan slash analyst. <laughs> I like analyst better. JC Kenny, how's it going, buddy? Man, I'm doing well. The Oilers are flying right now. They can't keep me not smiling at this moment, so I'm I'm doing really well. It's yeah. the final push here. Really? Their only blemish over the last six or seven games was that Toronto that game. That Toronto, yeah. And they had control of that game. It's obviously Three the one. mistakes there, but it's looking good. It's looking real good. Yeah, so let's start off. We were actually recording during this game last Tuesday. Yeah. Ottawa Senators in Edmonton, sorry, a 6-3 W. What was your kind of biggest takeaways from that game? Yeah, obviously we were recording, so we didn't really, I didn't really catch too, too much of the game. But from from what I saw, you know, it was a game where Edmonton just really kind of took over and dominated in stretches of that game. It felt like, um, you know, someone broke it down really well. It's like that was a game where they felt, you know, Ottawa was playing for their season right there and it felt like Edmonton kind of just took the control of that game and just sapped the life out of Ottawa yeah and that's that's really good to see obviously when you have I feel like that mentality is of course coming into what's upcoming playoff mm-hmm. matches when you you know you're on the brink of elimination or you have the chance to eliminate teams yeah so you know having that mindset within your team is obviously that's a great sign in this upcoming stretch here yeah, to, to beat desperate teams is never a bad thing, especially to put up a sixth spot. Yeah. That Ottawa Sens team was cruising into the deadline, makes the big ad. Chitrins look good, and that team's just kind of falling apart. I, I don't really know what to take of them. It's going to be a really interesting offseason there. Obviously, the big sale. R- reportedly today, the Ottawa Senators might sell for $925 million, which oh, would be really? a massive I, I, I didn't see any of that, actually. Yeah, 32 Thoughts today came out, and that's the rumor Friedman's heard. Uh, a couple websites, I think it was Bruce Garriock and like Forbes, had heard there was multiple bids over 900 Oh, wow. Breach could only li- to put, pin down one. Okay. But... Yeah, that's a massive win for the NHL and one oh. of the smallest markets in the league, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's huge. If I'm not mistaken, they were valued at last year 650 by Forbes. So, And they oh, don't wow. even have the arena. I think that might be part of the package is getting the arena. Okay, team. yeah. But that's super interesting for like the other Canadian markets to see a team oh, 100%. potentially go for that number. Absolutely. But let's move on from there. Thursday, we saw the Dallas Stars and another... 4-1 win for the Edmonton Oilers. What was your thoughts? Yeah, that one, that felt good. Against a team who just, you know, always seems to be in the fight. Mm-hmm. I mean, they go, feel like they go to overtime in every single game at Dallas. But, uh, yeah, Edmonton just took control of the game right from the first period and never really – they didn't let go. Like, they held the lead very well for the most part, On obviously only giving up the one goal against. Just a solid two-way game, like – like I kind of mentioned with this Ottawa game, once when they're committed to that full structure of playing a full defensive game, like obviously the offense is still strong enough where it's going to come, and they're just an extremely tough team to beat when they're playing in that system. Yeah, no, for sure. And it just seems like they've really found themselves. And this is the time of year you want to see them building up on that, right? Like we kind of mentioned, it was a great start in Toronto. Uh, obviously that kind of comeback loss could kind of derail things a little bit. And it's kind of done the opposite for the Edmonton Oilers, which is kind of the response you want to see from a team that is, you know, Stanley Cup or bust, like we kind of mm-hmm. talked about a couple of weeks ago. And if I recall correctly, like the goal they, that Dallas got was kind of just like a, a weird bouncing play. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like you can't even fault them for, for anything there. So it's definitely good signs there. That team sure feels like a paper tiger in yeah. the Central Division. Oh, 100%. Like and and you look at that roster, that team should be more competitive than it is. You, I would think so. Like yeah. the roster looks good; they have solid goaltending, obviously. But yeah. yeah, and that takes us into the third game of the week. It was a three for three week in Seattle on Saturday night. Yep. Big six four W high scoring affair. Yeah, that was a pretty big one. If you just look at the standings the rest of the way, that kind of 
it feels like that cemented the Oilers in the top three of the division. Yep. It seems like Seattle's going to kind of be that seventh or eighth wild card team, probably seventh, the way the Jets and the Flames <laughs> and the Preds, yeah, the whatever the fuck's looking. going on over there. None of those teams wants to make I it. I was going to say, no one wants that final spot. The Jets, six lowest <laughs> points percentage since January 17th, oh, and still ugly. in the spot. That is absolutely ugly. And that, that, that kind of reminds you like just how important those first 30 games of the le- year are like the oh, Jets absolutely. are the sixth worst team since January 17th and the Flames in Nashville haven't been able to pass them it's, that's a perfect example right there of you know, almost every game counts right like mm-hmm. anytime you can secure two points or get a point it's that's all clearly huge in this league yeah and that's and that's where we were kind of getting concerned with the Oilers early on in the yeah. year uh it's fortunate they kind of took off a little earlier than while well, these other teams aren't figuring it out but I remember that was my biggest concern when they were coming in tenth place. Is that yep. it's typically pretty fucking hard to jump teams in the NHL. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. So six four. Any big thoughts out of that one? Yeah, that was obviously the biggest game of the week, looking at the standings wise and in division. But uh, I felt like that was their worst game they played. Actually, they uh, got dominated right from the start, and just you know some fortunate goals. For the for the Oilers, there they're getting like heavy heavily outshot throughout that game. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it just seemed like it was a qu- it felt like a quiet game for them. Mm-hmm. Qu- it felt like it's funny I'm saying this it felt like a quiet night for McDavid in a three point. Yeah, affair, and then right? you look at the stat line; he's got three points. But I mean, I feel like that's got to be another positive. You know, when you're not playing at your best, is finding other ways to win a hockey game. For sure, for sure. Speaking of Connor McDavid, you know what? Let's lead off the podcast with him as a topic. Mm-hmm. Past 130 points for the first time since the early 90s, since before I was born, never mind you. Yep. And the way he's doing it, he's doing it by both scoring goals and setting up assists. Mo- a lot of it's on that power play, with which has become a kind of a weapon in Edmonton. Oh, for sure. But 134 points in 70 games, something I wasn't convinced we were going to see in the NHL in this generation. We were even talking about at the beginning of the year, the the over-under was at 128.5. And And I said I wanted to take it, but I couldn't do it until I saw it once. Yeah, absolutely. And we're already there, 70 games into the year. There's there's still 12 games. It's likely on the pace he's playing. He's going to be a 150-point player this year. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. And I I felt... When we were breaking down those predictions, I felt kind of crazy trying to take the mm-hmm. over. I felt like he would obviously hit 130, as I mentioned, in those preseason predictions. But, yep. I mean, you yeah, you absolutely nailed it. Until you see it, it's pretty hard to believe. But absolutely insane number, what, what he's doing this year. Yeah, and on that topic, uh, you, you kind of mentioned before we got on here, something you've seen in Connor McDavid's game. It, it happened to correlate with something Bob Stoffer was saying this week. Not someone we're usually on the same page with when it mm-hmm. comes to breaking down the game of hockey. But what have you kind of noticed in Connor McDavid's game this year that might uh, might explain this this boost in production? Yeah, I found this a, like as a really cool, interesting breakdown. You know, it's not that like McDavid. I'm sure he's gotten maybe you know a little faster, a little stronger. Mm-hmm. I and mean, obviously, I'm sure he's worked on his shot with those comments in the off season. But a lot of it is actually. Um, breaking down his like you know mental aspect of his game, you know when to attack opponents, you know examples like when a forward's covering on defense, you know you see he really attacks that spot, or when a defender's you know out there for a little longer, you know longer than a minute, minute and a half, that's where he's starting you know really attack the opposition, mm-hmm. and I think that was just something that was really cool that people maybe not realize when watching McDavid play, mm-hmm. and that's how you know he's putting up even more insanely numbers is how advanced he is of thinking the game of thinking the game and obviously the skill is way advanced on everyone too yeah and there's obviously the play of this season speaks for itself and it's just truly impressive to watch and another area of how like you know well he can think the game and how he's like you know five steps ahead of everyone yeah and what's crazy too is even even leon dry said he'll just at 100 points this this yeah. uh, past week and that's a guy that Normally number two right behind McDavid, and the gap's normally pretty close. There's Plus a 30-point 30 30 gap. points. Like, it's... It's nuts. It's absolutely insane. I'm sure, obviously, I think his shot's definitely gotten better. Mm-hmm. But I can't... I, 
I don't know. Has he gone faster? Like, I know he's just been flying by everyone from the start, but. Like, even just even just thinking about what we just said, me and Carson we were talking about how we were both really high on EP40 on the Vancouver episode. We said smash the 82 and a half over. Uh, he hit that this past week, kind of like the McDavid conversation we got going here. And we were awfully impressed to find that EP40, given how the Vancouver season's gone, had a 24-point gap over JT Miller. <laughs> and, like, that was pretty significant. Never mind Connor McDavid doing that and more to Leon Dreisel. It's I, I don't have words that could properly describe what a feat this is really becoming. Which is insane to like because Drysaddle's hockey IQ is obviously one of the best in the league, it's, mm-hmm. and he's you know just blowing everyone off out of the water right now. Like it's insane. It, it's kind of funny. Uh, I was talking about this with a couple guys that cover the sport uh, over the weekend, and we were talking about McDavid and Drysaddle and the the parallels or not the parallels, the differences in their game, yeah. right? Connor McDavid makes so much happen with the speed and the IQ, and it's almost like Leon Draisaitl is almost the exact opposite. Yeah, where he, he really relies on that big frame, that shot. He almost wants people to come attack him before he makes those moves or just bullies guys. Like yep. it's two completely different players that are elite, elite athletes doing it two completely opposite ways, but working together. It's just like it's. I don't know. Yeah, I don't have and the that was, words. That was another thing actually Stoffer broke down was another – how it's such a great fit because McDavid, instead of, you know, seeing him wheel it kind of end to end, you know, he's finding that pass and then, you know, kind of getting players to give it, give it back when he's, yep. you know, in the proper spot attacking with more speed yep. rather than, like I said, just, you know, carrying it through everyone. Mm-hmm. And that's another thing. Like it's just – adjustments like that is always making a world of a difference when he's torching everyone in points. For sure. And then uh, let's stay on the forwards here before diving into what might be the Edmonton Oilers' new best D pairing. Evander Kane yeah. c- came back, obviously a pretty serious injury. Let's let's touch on yeah, let's touch on the, his impact on the ice so far. In his last four games, he's got five points, uh, four goals and an assist. Obviously, there was times this year where we were kind of saying. McDavid and Drysaddle are scoring too much of the goals. Recently, we started to see that depth really pick up and kind of contribute. But adding another premier scorer who seems to have come back ready to go in Evander Kane, what have you kind of seen there with your takeaways on Evander Kane's return to the Edmonton Oilers lineup? Yeah, obviously, I guess not an, an ideal season of what he wanted with that big injury. It's a very scary one at that. But now, you know, he's kind of – he's – Healthy now, you see, he's starting to get back into you know game condition. Yeah, and you can definitely really see it on the ice. He scored his hat trick the other night, a big hat trick, obviously against the the crack in there. But um, yeah, that is something who they're gonna re- need to rely on heavy in the playoffs. And this is you know a feel good player right there. You know, someone who's maybe not had the best reputation in the league. It seems like he's you know really turned everything around in Edmonton from what. Obviously, I've read, heard, yep. and, and seen. But, um, yeah, that's another player who, you know, I don't like the idea of having players, you know, come back from injury and consider that your deadline ad. Yeah. But, I mean, it truly is when he's been out for half the season. But, yeah, that's definitely a, a huge benefit as he's coming into this stretch and just under a point per game right now. Yeah, obviously that was a big concern for me was every single place Evander Kane is gone, he's left disgraced. Yeah. Arguably, he should have been arrested and jailed in a couple of those spots. Like, it's kind of funny. Obviously, I have the first, I have the first hand experience in Winnipeg, knowing all the stories. For sure. And most of them were, they were immature young guy stories, yeah. walking out on bills, that kind of shit. But there was never anything other than, and even like when he he left town, it was the the track suit by Buff in the shower. The shower, yeah. But there was never anything that like was. Crazy, crazy. Right. And then the Buffalo Sega happens. The, yeah, the San, San Jose, Jose Sega stuff. happens. So, yeah, really, really good to see. He's obviously mm-hmm. a lot more mature and just seems like he's a lot more respectful. And having you know, another kid. Peers. Yeah, congrats to him having a having a son. I saw the gender reveal. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you caught that, but pretty cool. Had McDavid involved and well, there you go. And everything. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like McDavid's kind of really taking him under his wing there too, eh? Yeah, that. Yeah, and that's another thing. 
that's you know a great breakdown with McDavid is his leadership mm-hmm. has obviously taken a jump. Obviously, being a young captain isn't easy in the mm-hmm. league, but you know you've seen whenever there's you know kind of minor mistakes or issues on the ice, McDavid this year has hasn't hesitated. You know maybe to go up to a player and talk to him, and maybe correct some mistakes is also another huge development to do into his game. Yeah, for sure. Did you catch any of uh, Jay Woodcraft on uh, 32 Thoughts this past week, I believe it was? I did, yeah, I did actually. Uh, any, any thoughts there hearing from the head coach kind of talk about those relationships? He kind of mentioned what you were saying too, how C- Connor seems to have taken more of a leadership hands-on mm-hmm. approach this year. And he kind of joked when uh, the boys asked him if what, – what does he say to a player like McDavid? Is there yeah. ever any time he's on the film or whatever? And even Jay Woodcroft kind of gave us a look at what probably happens in a lot of franchises mm-hmm. where you kind of pull a star player away before the meeting and say, hey, you got to wear this today. Um, there's going to be a lot of mistakes by you. Mm-hmm. This isn't me trying to like shit on you, but it's yeah. me trying to use you as an example as a leader. Yep. And he even said he's like, obviously it doesn't happen much with Conor McDavid. Yeah. But even that kind of stuff, it sounds like he's been a true leader behind the scenes and hasn't let things like that even get to him. Yeah, I did. That was a great interview. It was really and good. I thought, um, but yeah, I think that's a really good, good breakdown. And obviously having that conversation beforehand in meetings is a big thing. But I mean, if you can not single out your best player, but, you know, point out his flaws into the game, obviously, especially someone with that high caliber of a player mm-hmm. is really probably eye opening to the rest of the team. And, you know, a big thing what uh, Woodcroft said was, you know, the accountability they have within that group. Mm -hmm. So if you're singling out the best player in the world, obviously everyone's going to be held accountable to that high of a standard as well. So I think that is that's a great breakdown in in that interview. Yeah, if you're an Oilers fan and haven't checked that out, highly recommend free generic just do great work in general. But that. Getting a peek behind the curtain with an NHL yeah, coach. Yeah, I thought it, it was fantastic. Yeah, it opens your mind a little bit. So, I thought that was great. That was definitely something I enjoyed. Uh, let's take a look. Obviously, me and you were both very very big fans of the Matthias Ekholm edition. Mm-hmm. Uh, the pairings haven't necessarily worked out the way I expected. I think you were kind of on to that, though. I remember I was kind of looking at Ekholm maybe helping Nurse um, with that pairing kind of being what it's been. Yeah. But uh, what a natural fit it seems like he's been for Evan Bouchard. Yeah. Who's a guy we both expected to kind of take that leap um, in Edmonton this year to become their top Mm D-man. What a breakout for them. It's only nine games, 122 minutes at five on five. But listen to these numbers. Right now they're rocking a, a Corsi four percentage which is simply shot attempts for versus against for the crowd that isn't aware. 56% of the shot attempts are in Edmonton's favor when that pairing is on the ice. If you're you're looking at just raw goals, they're outscoring the other team at 5-on-5, 14-4 for 78%. And their expected goals, which is the one I'd be looking at the most just because it has most predictive value over time. When they're on the ice, Edmonton currently has... 59% 59% of the expected goals. <laughs> like those are in that's top pair top of the NHL numbers. It's early in the pair, like 10 games, nine games ain't much, but if that keeps going into the playoffs, that changes everything for the Edmonton Oilers. Oh, 100%. This, the Ekholm effect, obviously you yeah. see Bouchard elevate his game already in those nine games. And just the team in general, like they're, I believe seven and two mm-hmm. with Ekholm right now. And that was, you know, even the big blow in the Leafs game, like that, it's it's impressive what you're seeing, and he's truly the perfect player that they needed, being the defense first, but not afraid, you know, join the rush or be, you know, a solid puck moving guy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's obviously a huge benefit to Bouchard. I think it's been a slight upgrade for Nurse. Mm-hmm. Hasn't been, really been the impact I was hoping for. I was, I think, hoping for a little more still, but. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's still literally, I think the more that you can get at home in games, maybe a more bigger role for him, you know, to take some more pressure off of Nurse. But yeah, you nailed it. Coming into the playoffs, that is the perfect deep pair and the perfect player. And I think that's what can get them over the top, maybe say against the Colorado Avalanche. Yeah. Like I think Ekholm is 
perfect guy to be on the ice against you know and Nathan McKinnon as we've mentioned before. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited. I think the only question and I was listening to a pod earlier was is the goaltending good enough? Yeah. And I that that is that is obviously one. the big question mark. I think Skinner has been truly solid all year for mm-hmm. the most part. He's obviously going to be the guy, and I think if the team can defend well, I think you know from from what I've seen, I just have a hard time seeing Skinner just collapse that heavily where he can't you know be the guy going forward so so is uh is jack campbell gonna be an oiler next year man is it are are you hinting a bio maybe i don't you can't trade (laughs) him i don't think you could trade him either that's nuts so uh, yeah i mean it's gonna be interesting i like if you want to be aggressive, you, I don't think you can be, right? But Yeah, this is going to be interesting. So I'm on Money Puck right now talking about the goaltending. Uh, obviously, I haven't broken down. It, I haven't done a games filter yet. But Stuart Skinner is basically allowing – on the year, he's allowed negative 0.5 goals uh, below expected, which, you know, it's fine. It's, it's, it's steady. You're stopping where you're supposed to, essentially. Yeah. That could go to zero next game kind of thing. Yep. But it is going to be kind of the test. Can the Oilers go on a lengthy run with a rookie goaltender that's been as advertised? Yep. Uh, obviously, the high-powered offense is there. Uh, you're seeing signs of life on the D side of things. So that that is definitely going to be the story going in this year. But, you know, we have we have seen stretches where Stuart Skinner's looked really damn good. And then we've seen stretches where he's been average to below average. So, you know, with goaltenders, right, you get hot at the right time. Who knows? Back to the Ekholm thing, though. I just kind of want to touch on this. Um, I started watching a bit more Edmonton recently ever since that ad. Obviously, they've gotten hot. Yep. And I remember early on when this pod was the Battle of Alberta podcast, I kind of talked about how Chris Tanev, really calms things down for the Calgary Flames. And when he's out of the lineup compared to when he was in it, it was a night and day team for a guy that's like a veteran fourth defenseman. Yep. He just had that calming effect on everything. And I can't help but have seen that with Matthias Ekholm compared to what I was watching earlier in the year. 100%, yeah. But just on another level, in my opinion, than where Chris Tannum's at at this time. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. He, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of special to watch Matthias Ekholm too because obviously he is on the backside, but like he just is involved in every part of the ice, whether it's setting up the breakout to being in the first four checker or like the yeah. the fourth guy four checking and creating offense. It's it's just he creates havoc every time he's out there, and it's it's been a big thing for the Oilers uh, ever since he came in. It's truly incredible, honestly. Like instantly turn into one of my favorite players, just mm-hmm. being able to watch him more and obviously understand his game more now that he's with Edmonton. Yeah, so we'll uh, we'll dive into the week ahead here. Uh, get you out of here. I know you have a big pickleball match coming <laughs> up. So tonight they're in the middle of a game against the San Jose Sharks. It is currently still one one. Yep. Who are you rolling with here? One one against the Sharks. I'm gonna take my Oilers. Mm-hmm. They have a nice little stretch coming up, and they have some teams to catch. I feel like they're gonna they're gonna continue to roll, and it's not stopping tonight. Yeah, high event first period, thirteen eleven shots for the yeah. San Jose Sharks. Oh uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna bet the talent wins out. We'll go with the Edmonton Oilers over the back forty of that game. Yep. Then Wednesday, you got Arizona rolling into town. Who do you got there? I'm going to take the Oilers again. Arizona's coming in on a back-to-back. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd like to think they can beat them even if it wasn't a back-to-back, but I just look at that. I mean, I know they've been playing good hockey, but I just look at that Arizona group, and I just I feel like there's no way they, they couldn't be able to compete. I mean, obviously, it's the NHL, and it's not going to be yeah. truly easy, but I have a tough time taking Arizona in that. So I'm going to take the Oilers this week with the game being in Edmonton. But when we record next weekend, I'm taking Arizona at home Monday in Arizona. I'm putting that out there right now. Okay. Okay. I'm calling yeah. the early yeah. shot. I actually saw their record at Mullet. It's <laughs> they insane. actually don't lose. So I think I might be I might be with you on that one. Their, their record at Mullet <laughs> Arena is unreal. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> we were wow because the Canucks played them last week, so we were yeah. breaking down the game for Edmonton, 
And uh, it was funny because Carson was talking about how shitty the, the Coyotes are and whatnot. I'm like, do you realize that they're tied with the Vancouver Canucks right now in the standings? <laughs> are they? Yeah. I didn't actually realize that. Canucks have played two less games, so the games okay. in hand are obviously going to come into play. But at this moment, they're tied for 7th or 8th, or however you want to look at okay. that at the bottom of the lottery. I actually didn't realize that. Yeah. They, they've been uh, desert dogs. Dude, they've been hot. Yeah. Like, Keller's having a great year. Hayden's having a second, a great second half. And they got two good goaltenders. They man. have very good goaltending. Uh, which takes us into Saturday. The Las Vegas Golden Knights on Hockey Night in Canada. It's a big one. Obviously. That is a yeah. big one. Who do you got? Ah, streak's going to come to an end. I, know, I think they play Vegas close in the games. I'm going to hope for a split, but I think Vegas is going to take that one. So I'm going to roll. I'm actually going to pick a 3 a week for the Oilers here. If you look at Vegas's last five to seven games, they've cratered in expected goals. They yeah. have just been on a downward spiral. They started some guy I've never heard of in net the other day, and I like to think oh, I have Patera a yeah, yeah Patera. I saw that game. And I like to think I have a pretty good knowledge <laughs> of most of the league. And yeah. Oh, I don't even know this guy's starting. They're not getting saves. I think that's a statement night for the Oilers, and I think they got to take it to the Vegas Golden Knights that night. Yeah, I will say if Edmonton's not catching top of the the division, I hope LA does because I would rather see Vegas in the playoffs than, mm-hmm. than them, as I mentioned. So. No, I I could not agree more with how that's shaping out. All right, we we'll, we'll c- call it quits here. Anything you kind of want to say uh, heading into this week or uh, getting ready for next week? No, I just look forward to how this all plays out. Obviously, the rest of these games they have. Two, you know, easier matchups. I just really hope they take advantage of that, obviously, if because they're chasing points in yep. this division. Yeah, so I just got a couple top line announcements here. Uh, if you're a fan of the show, obviously, we've been cleaning things up for YouTube. Make sure to check out the video. We're also breaking down these segments and posting them separately on YouTube. So if you got buddies or someone that they don't like the long form, you know, send them some segments. See if they uh, are digging the content. Uh, if you're a West, uh, Western Canadian Blue Jays fan, we're going to be starting to stream live Blue Jays broadcasts for the Sunday afternoon games. And uh, we'll have Blue Jays content coming out once a week, kind of like these hockey podcasts. So if you're looking for some baseball, make sure to stick around with Team Top Line. And you know what? Thanks for all the support. We're, we're really enjoying where this is kind of taking us. Yeah, absolutely. Love the adjustments and... Look forward to keeping this rolling. Yes, thank you. Thanks.